Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown. I don't know why I keep on saying that, but that's what my teacher always says. Keep on saying something, people will remember it. So I'm Chris Brown, your host, and today I'm pleased and honored to have in our guest. She is currently running for the nomination for the Alberta NDP in the Calgary riding of Calgary Glenmore for the upcoming 2023 provincial election. Try and say that five times fast. Uh, Jennifer Burgess. Jennifer, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. I'm really happy to be here, Chris. So, Jen, let's get this out of the way. As someone who has listened to the show before, as you've uh, said in our pre-interview, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a good question, Chris. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it made me think a lot when you asked me that question. And, you know, I think, I think I was called to serve community at a pretty young age. You know, I look back at my childhood. I grew up in a working class family um, here in Calgary, grew up during the Klein years. Um, you know, I saw, I saw around me how the leaders really kind of failed to protect my family and my community. And I had two parents who worked full time, sometimes more than full time and blue collar jobs and sometimes like still just couldn't keep their head above water. And I think I knew from a pretty young age that that was, there was something wrong there and that something had failed us. And um, as I, as I grew up, I had some just incredible mentors in my life. Like I, I think about teachers, you know, public school teachers just like changed everything for me. Um, you know, shout out to Mr. Crichton at St. Helena, who took me under his wing and uh, got me in speech and debate club, uh, model UN, you know, doing all those nerdy things that um, just really opened up my eyes to the fact that I could have a voice at the table, you know, that I, I had a voice in this arena and I could have a voice that could affect change. And so I, I credit a lot of my, my early motivation to those mentors and in my education and in my faith community and um, when I was a teenager, I met, uh, through some volunteer work, I met someone who was running for the NDP. This was in 2008. My, uh, my mentor at the time, Julie Herzlicka, was running for the NDP, and she asked me to come on her campaign, and I had no idea what that meant. No, no involvement in a political life at that point, but it sounded fun. So I signed up to run her phone bank. So this is, that's dating myself a bit, back when we had phone banks, and they were a big deal. Um, I ran the phone bank and I just, I just loved it. I loved the energy around it. I loved the interesting people that showed up at the campaign. And um, I, I saw too, just how, how there was a lack of diversity of voices in this arena and how I, I had something to offer here. I had a voice and I had some skills that could make change in politics and we did not win the election, but um, I came out of that with some experience that I carried through the rest of my life and since then have managed lots of campaigns, been involved in lots of non-for-profit and community work. And I think it started early on. Now, uh, I, want, I want to stick with your uh, growing up for a little bit here because I want to get to yeah. know who is Jen? Who is Jen and why is she running for uh, provincial politics? Um, you talk about that first introduction in 2008 to politics, but you don't just randomly show up one day and say, I'm going to get involved in politics. You talk about your mentor -er, who uh, they were as the candidate. Mm -hmm. Was politics discussed at the dinner table as growing up? Like, were your mom and dad politically motivated? Because I can remember my dinner table conversations where we talked about Bob Ray. We talked about Dalton McGinty back in Ontario. But for you, it doesn't sound like that was the case. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's uh, you know, something my mother had said a few times. I don't know where this came from <laughs> because it was uh, her family was very much like, no politics, no religion at the dinner table, you know, that kind of family. So um, yeah, it's hard to say. I think it was, you know, just the luck of being around some really amazing change makers in my life. Like I, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, teachers, volunteer work, you know, faith community. Um, and it wasn't called politics, you know, I, I didn't say, yeah, I love politics. I, uh, I love the idea of serving your community and of affecting change and saw early on how that, that sort of grassroots work is what makes change happen. You know, the, the simple things, door knocking, stuffing envelopes, uh, you know, calling your neighbors, having little block parties where you talk about how to address the speed limits in your neighborhood. Like those, those little community actions are, uh, are what push things forward slowly and silently. It's not always easy and it's not always quick, but um, I, I got to witness that pretty early on, yeah. You talked about growing up in the Klein years. I wasn't here in, in Alberta at the time, but growing up at in in the '90s and a little bit of the 2000s, did did that shape your political beliefs? Because what brought you to the Alberta NDP? Because 
you, you talk about your mentor, you talk about your growing yeah. up, but there's other parties out there. So what was it about the Alberta NDP that drew you to them? Yeah, great question. Um, and, you know, I, I volunteer for a few political parties. I'm, you know, by, by no means, I, I'm not attached to one specifically. But I think, you know, what, what eventually drew me to really committing myself to doing this work with the NDP was shared values. You know, I, like you said, I saw from those early years how things like public education um, can change the world. And I, I know it sounds a bit dramatic, but I think it's the foundation of our democracy is having a strong public education. And uh, that wasn't always there for me. You know, I, I remember, I think it was my ninth grade math class where it was standing room only in that classroom. Like you had to rush there from your previous class to get a seat. And uh, I didn't do well in that class because I often couldn't hear the teacher <laughs> was standing at the back with 10 other kids. Um, and so I think about that experience and uh, you know what that did to a generation and uh, how there was a, a lack of priority in thinking about how to, how to serve those kids that are gonna be our future leaders. And so, um, you know, when, I, that was a passion from early on is supporting education. And I see that reflected in the NDP, you know, that's been consistently part of their platforms is support for a strong public education. Uh, we'll talk about some policy issues later on in the episode because well, I'm assuming we'll be talking about education because of what just was announced earlier this week. Well, as of recording last week, uh, as of airing this last week, I should say. Um, but I want to stick on this for a second because I, I, I want to talk about shared values. We are in a very politically divided time right now. And how do you believe you and the Alberta NDP best represent the values that Albertans have in this divided time? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there's a difference between uh, discourse being very uh, politicized and uh, being in a divided time. Because I don't know if I actually agree with you, Chris. I think when I'm out of the doors, um, Glenmore isn't traditionally, you know, super strong conservative or super strong ADP. It's kind of a swing riding, you know, we're a bit all over the place. Um, but what comes up at the doors doesn't really have to do with either. Um, you know, I think the, the values that bring us all together are wanting better for our communities. Um, you know, I talk about people are worried about their kids, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic. And so it's, a, it's an era where people are really thinking about what's important and what's critical. And the things that people talk about are education, healthcare, safety. You know, those are those are the things that people are focused on now, and that all comes down to strong public supports, and that is, you know, the basis of any NDP policy. So, um, I, you know, I would say that that's pretty clearly reflected to me in what people's priorities are right now. Kind of trying to come out of this really difficult, complicated time. No, and I appreciate that because yeah. I, I, I haven't been out at the doors, so I'm not hearing what people are saying. I'm only seeing what's on social media. And let's be honest, social media is a very much of a vacuum and it should never be yeah. trusted of what the, the way the winds are blowing. I, I want to talk about moving forward now because you have put your name forward for the Alberta NDP in the writing of Calgary Glenmore. It is a contested nomination. Um, mm -hmm. So why why now? And why, what, what about this time, this day of age, do you believe you would be best, the best person to represent Calgary Glenmore in the Legislative Assembly of Alberta? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, I've been asked about it a few times over the last few years. Um, I, I managed the last campaign here in 2019 and um, kind of got asked right away what my thoughts were, but I, I had a baby, so it wasn't top of mind. And so it's kind of come back the last year or so. I've started to be asked about it again. And um, you know, the thing is, I have deep roots in my community. I live in Calgary, Glenmore. I'm raising a family here with four kids. Um, you also, you might have seen I'm the president of my community association here in Brayside. So through those various different roles, you know, being pretty embedded in my community, I was just hearing every day from my neighbors about the challenges they were facing. I was, you know, parents of the playground were talking about how um, often, you know, mothers are getting forced out of the workforce because no one could find childcare and no one could afford it. Or uh, we'd have seniors calling us at the community association saying like, why are my benefits lower? And, um, you know, age recipients struggling with changes to their programs. So I'd be hearing from the community that there were all these challenges um, coming out of, like I said, a really difficult time when we should be focusing on supporting our community and making sure those social supports were there. And so I, I felt very deeply that my community deserves better than this. You know, we, I don't believe we have 
an advocate right now for us in the legislature. I don't believe we have anyone looking out for those people in Glenmore. Um, Glenmore has a higher than average population of seniors and our most growing population is young families. So we have demographics that need social support right now. And I didn't feel like there was anyone out there um, doing that work for them. And I kind of thought about my experience, you know, I thought about, am I the right person for it? And I, I've worked in um, government, I work at the municipal level right now. And um, previously I worked for the provincial government with Rachel Notley as the press secretary. So I have that experience being in there, seeing how policy gets made, you know, both good policy and not so good policy. And I have a bit of a behind the scenes look at, you know, how government works and how we can affect change. And I felt, um, you know, looking forward to this next, not looking forward, but like looking to this next election, I think we're going to need some experienced people at the table. I was, you know, thinking a lot about how if the NDP wins, if we form government, um, there's going to be a lot of work to do. You know, we don't, we don't know what we're going to be entering into. This is a new era for Alberta, this like switching of governments back and forth. It's going to be complex. And so I you know, I thought about, I have this background about knowing how to advocate for my community, knowing what people need here, but also the professional background that I could be a really strong member of the caucus. And so, um, yeah, I think eventually I just came around to the fact that I, I think I have to put my name forward. I feel so strongly about this. Um, I, I feel like I need to be that advocate where there isn't one right now. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit CalgaryCaesarFest.com and get your tickets today. Now, uh, I, I, I'm going to be an outlier here because I believe in community uh, representation. I believe that um, if elected, you should be on the ground as much as possible talking to your community members. Now, as someone who has worked at the legislature yourself, as someone who has married someone who worked at the legislature, my husband, Ricardo Miranda, I know that the job of an MLA is up in Edmonton and down here, and you're split between the two areas. So how do you balance that? How would you balance your Edmonton work schedule, but also being that community representative? Because it is a daunting task and it is hard and you would have to be split between two cities. So how do you envision representing the people of Calgary Glenmore where they don't go wake up the day after the election and say, well, I won't see her for another four years until election time. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, and it's, it, yeah, thank you for asking that. I think people often don't realize for Calgary MLAs that that's like a piece of the puzzle, right? That they, they have to think through. Um, it's quite different than being in an Edmonton MLA. So yeah, thanks for bringing that forward. And we have talked about that in our family. Um, I do have a really supportive partner and I would kind of say that's, you know, the key piece. Like you mentioned, he does have political experience. He knows what it's like. Um, we, we have supportive family around us. And so um, I think, you know, trying to make the work-life balance happen will, will be a lot of, you know, leaning on the people around me. But I also think when I've, you know, learned from experienced politicians, um, and I've kind of seen how they've done this work. I think it's not always just about the amount of time you're spending in the community, but the quality of time you're spending in your community, right? And yep. you're not just here, you know, I'm not just sitting on the patio at 1600, even though there'll always be a bit of that, but, um, you know, are you actually engaging with constituents? Are you listening to them? You know, are you just doing Facebook lives where you put information out there or are you actually getting people to talk to you and listen to you? Like you alluded to, are you at the doorsteps? Are you coming to where they're at? And so I think being strategic about making sure that that time you're in the writing is like really rich engaging time um, can be much more important than just you know the amount of time you're here as someone who has that local experience being a member the uh, chair of the uh, community association does that give you a leg up to know what is affecting the people of calgary glenmore because People often put their names forward and they expect that they, they they have a pulse on the ideas of what is affecting their the residents of the riding. But for someone who has been on the ground, not just 
a year before the election, but for some time, does that give you a leg up and does that give you knowledge that would best uh, make you a better MLA if elected? Yeah, I think so, Chris. I think um, we, like I alluded to earlier, we haven't really had representation here that's been on the ground in that way in a long time um, at a few different levels of government, I would say. And so I think Glenmore is really in need of an advocate that knows what's going on here. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to be someone to say community associations are the perfect sounding boards for those things. You know, there's challenges in those institutions too. But um, I do, I do try to be a leader in that role that that is a listener and that is serving the needs of my community. And it's not about my needs or my agenda, but listening to, to what people are telling us and what they need. And I've been a president of that board uh, during COVID. I inherited it just as, as COVID started. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a creative challenge to figure out, you know, it's quite a switch. You know, what does this community need now is quite different. Um, you know, when I first came on board of the organization, I was chairing a transportation committee and we were talking about, uh, speed limits and bus routes um, that didn't happen after COVID you know now it was just like how can you know the senior can't get to the grocery store how is she going to get her medication or you know these kids they're home from school but their parents have to go to work who's going to watch them like it just became a totally different sort of scenario but what kind of supports people need and I think if you're not on the ground you don't see that real-time change um, real-time needs changing and I think that's so important because you can't just listen to focus groups. You know, you can't just pop in every once in a while and think you know what's going on. Things change quick. And, uh, you know, what the community needs is not what you always think they need. And so you have to be checking in. You have to be on the ground there. Yeah. So that, it brings up a good point because as a candidate, as someone who wants to put their name forward, I'm assuming you had an idea what the concerns were going to be at the door when you went door knocking. I'm assuming you mm -hmm. thought, this is what I'm going to hear. But that is not always the case. There's always going to be those outliers where you go, I didn't realize this was a concern. Mm -hmm. Have you heard yeah. those concerns? And if so, have you been shocked about what you've been hearing at the doors around issues that people are faced today? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely been some surprises around, um, you know, challenges families are facing here. I think I, I found out about the doors before I found out, you know, in the media cycle <laughs> or in news releases, because I actually learned about, you know, how these utility, um, like, for example, our utility rates, like I'm sure you guys have experienced, just skyrocketed uh, enormously. And I, I first found out about that from my neighbor, <laughs> who's like, did you see your NMAX bill this month? What's going on? And a bunch of us gathered in the cul-de-sac and we're comparing notes. Um, so, you know, things like that, I, I find out quicker. I find out indoors. Um, I, just this morning, I was, I was out making a few rounds because I know there's uh, uh, some people who are home in my neighborhood and I was door knocking and there's a student at home and he was mentioning uh, how the tuition hikes that uh, the UCP have just decided to push forward are going to affect him and that was something you know I wasn't fully aware of uh, the impact to my community yet so um, learning sort of first firsthand I guess you could almost say directly from the people who are affected by these changes has been um, a helpful although sometimes a bit depressing <laughs> surprise at the doors because I just think, oh, that's like, that's something else I'm going to have to think about. I'm going to have to learn more about that because uh, things move, things move fast at you. <laughs> they, they certainly do. Yeah. And if the last two years has taught us anything, you have to be prepared and you have to be able to balance a lot of issues at one time. You, yeah. You've talked openly about healthcare being a priority, an issue in the area, education, mm -hmm. COVID-19, mm -hmm. tuition fees, energy prices. How does the NDP best address those issues moving forward because there is a lot of different opinions in this uh, province and if you go poll every single person on your street you're going to hear something from every different house differently so how do you address it that is best for everyone and how do you as the MLA or the potential MLA best address those at a provincial level in a in a caucus setting mm -hmm. oh man great question that's the ultimate political puzzle, right? Um, you know, I think, like, I'll, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just start with this, Chris, and I don't mean to, to start, you know, going in opposition right away, but I think the big challenge we have right now with this government is I, I don't think they're governing. I think they're very distracted. 
by ideology. They've got a lot of infighting. There's a lot of internal politics going on that you know the media seems to be constantly reporting on. Um, that is not the way to support people through those issues that you were referencing, Chris. We need a government that is focused on what's happening to people on the ground. And I, I've worked with Richard Holly. I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for a second because yeah. I want I want to challenge you on that because I, I'm not trying yeah. to be uh, confrontational. I just want to know. Are you hearing the fact that there's internal conflict going on in the UCP and it's affecting the day-to-day lives of people when you're door knocking? Are you saying, I wish the I wish the government would just actually get their act together and get back to work and stop fighting with each other? Because I've heard that a few times. I'm just wondering as a candidate, mm-hmm. are you hearing that from yeah. an opposition oh, yeah. standpoint? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, often when we're at the doors, the kind of like the, the pitch you start with is how do you feel about your government? How do you feel about the provincial government right now? And that's usually the first place people say, I don't know, like I saw the news this morning, they've got some contested nomination that's causing all this drama. Jason Kenney's trying to like maneuver his leadership race. And like, I don't, there's all these things going on in the party. I don't know what they're doing to help me and my, you know, my seniors benefit or what are they doing with my pension? <laughs> or like, how are we going to deal with this disastrous curriculum that teachers don't want to teach? Like, that's what people want to know about, but our government just seems like distracted internally. Yeah. So what would make the NDP different then? Because uh, yeah. you've seen you as a press secretary, a former press secretary for the province, you know that politics is, is an everyday thing. And as much as we don't want to talk about party politics, it does come up a lot. So how do you believe that Rachel Notley mm-hmm. and the NDP would better address these issues compared to the UCP? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, from my, my experience, um, you know, sorry, seeing Rachel lead and, and being in that government, um, you know, the NDP is is driven by values and they're driven by a data-based platform, which is something that I think we've, we've forgotten should be expected of a government. When you make policy decisions, they should be based on data. They should be based on research that is, you know, has high integrity, is done by a third party. Um, and I saw that, you know, when I was in government, you know, of course there's internal politics, but deep down policy and decisions were made based on information that, you know, we relied on thought leaders and, uh, you know, really, really smart bureaucrats to help us make those decisions and to guide our leadership. Um, and I, I, you know, it's, it seems silly to even say that because that's just like such a fundamental part of being a government, but I feel like it's not anymore, you know, <laughs> and it has to be reminded that that's an expectation of our governments is that they're making decisions based on solid information, solid data, and what's best for the province. And I 100% believe the NDP will do that when reelected. I want to talk about difference of opinions. As an MLA, you were there to represent everyone and not just the people who voted for you. As much as this part, this current government seems to forget that knowledge, it seems to be something that they should have a little crash course in remembering. Do you talk to the opposing side? Do you talk to members of the UCP? Do you talk to the Liberals? Do you talk to Alberta Party members and say, what are the issues facing you? Because when I vote, I, 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 I try to look for the person who's best going to represent all of us and not just the people who vote for them. So for you, mm-hmm. how do you do that? Yeah, great question. I mean, it is something, um, you know, often, especially those who are in, those of us in Calgary who have been doing politics here for a while or active in our communities, it's not new to us. You know, this is, this was PC land for 40 years, you know, so it's, uh, it's not something new. It's something, you know, most of us work with people who have political different opinions. Most of our family members have different political opinions. So I would, uh, I would say there's nothing out of the usual there for us right now. But, um, you know, I think, like you alluded to earlier, I think there's some really heightened partisan politics that are being driven, unfortunately, a bit by political leadership right now. And um, trying to rise above that, I think, is, is really critical right now. And trying to remember what is important, what are our shared goals, what are we trying to do? You know, where can we collaborate? There are places we'll never come together. Where are some places we can come together? If something's really bothering you, what's the root of that? What's the root fear of that? Um, how can we how can we work together on you know at least talking about it? We're not always going to see eye to eye in the solution, but I think that being able to talk about it piece um, is is most important to me when I'm 
you know, frequently at the doors and someone doesn't disagree with me politically, it's pretty common, but, um, you know, talking about, well, where does that come from? Like, what's important to you? What drives you? And reminding, uh, reminding folks that that's what leadership and government should be about. You know, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm showing up on people's doorsteps. Um, it's not about a logo or a brand or, you know, pushing an ideology forward. It's about, um, yeah, what do, what do we stand here? What are we trying to achieve? Calgary, Edmonton. Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. So on, uh, just to go off of that, yeah. you will be elected to represent Calgary Glenmore, if you were elected in 2023. Now, you will have to make choices and votes. You will have to vote on issues that will affect the day to day lives of people in Calgary Glenmore. Mm -hmm. I want to know from you how do you balance what you believe is right against what you're hearing from your constituents? Do you vote for what your constituents want? Or do you vote for what you believe is right? And I, I just want to, and I'm not sure, and I've asked this to municipal councillors, if you remember during the last municipal campaign, yeah. uh, I have asked this to federal politicians as well. I want to know, how do you balance that? Because I think that's a challenging job as an elected official is to mm -hmm. stick to your morals and your values, but also represent the people that have put you there. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't know if I can give you a simple answer, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, like simple answers. I like long drawn out because if not, yeah. it'd be a very bad interview. <laughs> I know. It might be a bit of a long drawn out one because, um, you know, I think that's, that does come up sometimes, you know, of course. Um, but, but, you know, my community association work, it's come up where there's, the community is very, very concerned about something. I don't personally believe it should be where we focus our resources. You know, that, that has happened a few times. Um, and so you have to, I think, you know, look at those situations in a, in a larger strategic uh, sense. You know, I think if you're, if you're trying to look at those situations and like panicking and trying to run around and feel like you have to decide between the two every time, then it's never going to work. You're never going to feel like you necessarily followed your own values or morals or you made everyone happy. It's probably going to just be a lot of unhappy people. And so I think, you know, remembering what your goal is, you know, what, what is important to you? Why are you here? Where are you going? And then looking at that, you know, piece of policy or whatever it is within that context, you know, is it something that's going to completely lead you astray from where you're, what your values are, where you're going? So something that maybe doesn't really matter in the long run and, um, you know, it can be looked at in a different context. And so um, when, I, when I think of situations, I don't want to be specific because I don't want to like throw community members under the bus, but, um, you know, there have been situations in my community association where I've said, like, I want you to know I've listened to you. Like, I hear your concerns. I've documented it. I've researched it. I don't agree this is the priority for the community right now. Um, and it's, you know, sometimes it upsets people, but I think if you're doing it in a way that is respectful and shows that you put some thought into it and you put some research into it, um, it's, you know, it's all part of, you know, where you're going, what are you trying to achieve? Yeah, N not easy. No, it's not. And I appreciate your honesty there because yeah. I think a lot of people do forget that from time to time. I, I want to, mm -hmm. I want to ask one last sort of tough question, but not really tough question. If you're if you're a candidate, you should have this easy answer already. So this answer already in the bag. But why you? Why should you be the the candidate? We'll, we'll start off with that one. Why should you be the candidate for the Alberta NDP for Calgary Glenmore in the 2023 or whatever they call it election? Yeah. Uh, I, I alluded to it a few times. I have deep roots in Calgary Glenmore. I think it's really critical we have local representation now. I've been here on the ground doing work for over two years now. I've been at the doors. You know, I call members. They know my name. They know I've been here advocating for them and listening to them. Um, you know, I, I didn't just show up when the polls started looking good. I was here, you know, after the 2019 election, I was picking up signs. <laughs> I was, um, you know, we had our AGM a month later and I was elected president and I started the work right away in that constituency association. Um, and I, I say this because I think it's important we have representation here that is committed and that is experienced and that knows the community. 
Um, I feel that really strongly about Glenmore. I feel that has been lacking. I feel, um, you know, I think if you have people here who just don't have the experience, don't have background, don't know the community, you're not going to get the effective representation that Glenmore deserves. You have a nomination uh, meeting. I'm not sure if it's actually been set, has it? Not yet. No, no it has not been set. Yep. But there will be a nomination meeting. What do you do, what do you have to do now between now and that date, whenever it is, to ensure that you are the successful candidate? Mm. Yeah, I'm hustling. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and how can people get a hold of you, contact you, get a hold like yeah. to know you a little bit more? Because we've talked for about 35 minutes and I guarantee you there's at least one question that someone's saying, why didn't you ask this question? So how can people <laughs> get a hold of you, get in touch with you, follow you on social media? How can they do that? Yeah, do all those things. I, um, you know, we're we're using lots of ways to contact voters. Glenmore is pretty diverse in terms of how you reach people. So we're um, we're door knocking every Saturday. We're phone calling every Sunday. I'm doing phone calling during the week. We've got a letter campaign going out. Um, so I, you know, we're we still don't know the nomination date like you alluded to. So it's a bit hard to figure out timelines. But um, you know, for me, it's really just trying to reach as many members and potential members as I can right now. So uh, that's been really really interesting and you, you have to be creative in how that works, but uh, it's been quite fun too. I have to say after, you know, being in COVID land for a few years and not seeing a lot of people, like being this big push, I'm, you know, I'm a people person. So I'm like happy to be out there talking to people as much as I can. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, there's a, a lot of people in Glenmore, it's a big riding, a lot of work to do. So the best way to find me is my website, which is jenniferburgess.ca. And through there, you can find all my social media links. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, a little bit less so, but I'm trying to get better on Instagram. And uh, you can, I know. Just, just, don't strength, say, yeah, just don't say TikTok and you've won me over right there. Yeah, I haven't even tried. I know I have a, I have a 13 year old step kid that would disown me, I think, if I did that. <laughs> Maybe someday. Um, but yeah, social media is uh, my web, my email address is jenforcalgaryglenmore at gmail.com, the number four, if you're more of an emailer. Um, yeah, um, for those who don't check. know, who have never listened yeah. to this before or watched an episode, links are in the show notes. Just scroll down. There they are. They are the YouTube page. If you're on Spotify, down there. Exactly. As Jen points down there. And if you're watching, if you're listening to this on your car stereo, pull over and then go back on Spotify or Apple podcast. And there's all the information. Perfect. One last question before we actually do our wrap up here. What have I missed? What would you want people to know Ooh. that we haven't talked about? Because we have covered a lot in 35 minutes. And I just want to give you the opportunity to say, because there's probably a question in the back of your head. And you said, I wish you would have asked that. What is that question? Oh. And how would you answer it? Oh, my gosh. Um, what about Calgary, mm. Glenmore? What about the current government? Would you want people to know and remember heading into a nomination meeting? Yeah, you know. What I want people to know when I think about at the doors, and I was alluded to, it's been it's been tough for people in Calgary Glenmore. It's been a struggle for families here for the last few years. And what I always try to say to people at the doors is, um, I need you to know that there's hope that things are going to get better, that this is not forever. You don't have to have a government that's attacking you and trying to take away your social supports. There is hope. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I know, but I feel like it needs to be said, you know, I feel like I try to say it over and over because these are tough times for a lot of reasons. There's a lot going on in the world that is difficult for people in my community and I'm sure all over Alberta. And so I think, um, you know, that reminder that things have to get better, they will get better, but we need to do the work. We need to think about it now and do the work now. I'm a candidate who is doing that work. I'm at the doors, I'm talking to people, I'm thinking about strategy for how we're going to come out of this recovery even better and even stronger than we went into it. And it will happen, but we have to do the groundwork now. So that's why I would love the support of anyone listening. Um, if you know anyone in Calgary, Glenmore, get them to give me a call because um, there is hope, but we've got to do the work now. I appreciate that. Jen, yeah. I, I want to thank you for doing this. I, 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 I am always in awe when people a want to come and chat with me but b put their name forward on a ballot no matter what level of government no matter what uh party or affiliation you are i i give 
credit to all candidates out there who do it because it is a tough job and you have been doing it. You've been knocking on the doors and I give you credit for that. So I wish you the best of luck on the soon to be hopefully called uh, Calgary Glenmore nomination. So that way you at least have a date so you know when it is. And uh, uh, I, I, as I said, if you want to learn more about Jen, if you want to learn more about the Alberta NDP, scroll down, find the information. It is clear as day, figure out. And I said this a lot during the municipal campaign. And I'll say this again, vote for the person that's going to best represent your values, your morals, and your community. Because at the end of the day, if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. So with that, Jen, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thank you for having me, Chris. This has been a great conversation. Uh, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking, have a conversation, get out from behind social media. And when a candidate comes to your door, be nice to them or a volunteer, be nice to them. Uh, like Jen, be nice to Jen. She's an amazing person. <laughs> anyway, guys, have yourself an excellent day. Talk to you later.